to pick out to what I've been, we've been, I've been introducing you so far, the way you can read and pre-stack shot gather by looking at the geometry of the parabolics, direct line or refracted line, what they look like as a linear line or the refracted one as a parabola. Oh, wait, that's perfect like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way you don't see from that. And uh, we have seen you can read the parabolic function as the way it is registered by various offsets at a certain distance back to the source. We have learned that in reality the apex of the hyperbolics represent the place where you expect to see the real position of the reflector on the horizontal reflector. In case I'm exploring a parallel, more or less parallel situation. So apex to apex for every hyperbola should give you an idea of more or less the thickness of the layer in times. We are in times. Everything, all the story works if you are looking at the diagram in <coughs> times space. So the thickness is in times. And that's where it comes from. The problem is that when you apply the normal mobile, you can do that manually, in which you decide to pick up several trays, like the several trays in there, and to apply the right normal move out, so the right delta t in times, to pushing back <coughs> this kind of in a flat geometry, the various reflector that you got. We have seen that what is controlling the aperture of your hyperbola is basically the ratio between the distance between the offset, longer basically offset, the deeper it is basically the representation of the hyperbola. The deeper is the reflector, the highest is the velocity reflector, the flatter look like the hyperbola. So, the geometry of your hyperbola can tell you a lot of information about relative velocity between layer to layer. Apex to apex, the relative distance in times, flatness or not, the relative velocity relationship between the various hyperbolas. Now, the reality is that when you do the normal move out like that, manually, you are applying a variation of time to re-represent, basically, your hyperbola to a flat horizon. But when you apply your delta t to move with the normal move out, you still don't know which is the component of this delta t that is related to the, well, you know the x that is the distance, because you know the distance of the offset. But you don't know, well, you know the, 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 the thickness of the depth in terms of times, but you don't know the depth in meters. And the only way you two can get the depth in meter is by testing, which is the velocity, which you don't know. You should apply the velocity but when you apply the velocity to a normal move out, we are applying both the velocity and both for the thickness. So which of the two are controlling the, the games? That's, that's the tricky part of it. I mean, the complicated part of it. Because both can play in the same way. Remember the equation, something like that. So that's the only information you know. That one, you know it if you want in time, but not in, 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 in meter. It's two-way travel times, apex to apex of your so what is going to control you or to tell you what is the real thickness in meters is which are velocity that you are assigning the same time you are assigning the normal ones. But when you apply the normal move out manually, you apply a delta t. So you don't know exactly how those are playing or affecting basically the question. So the problem you got is that you need to do a try and error, even the software, what they do, they do a best estimation or what is basically <coughs> the best velocity at a certain depth that can restore the real geometry of every single reflector? We are going to see that in the next, next um, 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 lecture when I'm going to introduce you the concept of the velocity to the system and when I'm going to introduce you the processing game. And you will realize that the normal move out operation is a quite fundamental operation for any kind of imaging of flat receiver in which is done, is run by people that are basically assigning velocity that best are best fitting or creating a best fitting of the parallel geometry of your reflector. Now, that has been an example, but to give you just food for thought, what's happening if the velocity is changing laterally? The hyperbole is changing, dipping laterally. So it's become an hyperbolic function 
depending on the cubic, on the fourth order, the fifth order, etc., etc. So if you think in 2D, 3D, then the game is not that easy because you have to understand which page is going to change the velocity, and that's quite complicated. So again, the normal move-outs work very well as a good approximation of the estimation of the stack velocity in order to represent the real imaging of the two-way travel type path as far as you got a kind of lateral continuous velocity pretty flat. As soon as you got deep in, as soon as you got lateral change of velocity, we should, we should move necessarily to the forward modeling migration models. And then we're going to see, actually, next week we're going to see it. <coughs> That's the basics of the physics. So that's an example of a simulated, I simulated a very simple pre-stack shot gather. So I assign some velocity, I assign some kind of property of the layer, and you can Simulate how much geophone you want them to, or you want to <coughs> reproduce to simulate the trace. If you do an experiment of acquisition in which you got the source around the zero, okay, and an image like that, that is exactly the diagram we have been reading up to now, in which the time was basically mirrored on the top. Now the time is mirrored below. It's oh, it looks like a real piece of texture together after registration without noise. I will show you the real one, they are much more complicated, but step by step. The two linear lines, green and red, they clearly represent, you know now to recognize them, and the reason you know to recognize them is because the green one start, is the only one starting at the zero, the point zero, so zero of depth and zero offset, linearly going down as a linear function, so the green one needs to be necessarily direct. The other linear line that is starting at a certain distance, and the distance you can pick up in terms of meters from your geophone, so you understand that the geophone, if this is 200 meters, and you got the kind of, one, two, two, uh, kind of 20 geophone in between, is 10 meters every geophone, while it's telling you that if it is in milliseconds, we are acquiring almost at a very, very shallow, basically, condition. What is happening is that here you see first arrival of the refractive wave is registered by a geophone that is a distance of 40 meters. So you need to have basically a second layer somewhere that is creating an object that is registered by the geophone, and this second layer needs to have a higher velocity with respect to the first one. It is being registered probably, not probably, it's being registered by the direct wave. Okay? Where you got the position of this kind of second layer? Where the second layer start? where the first hyperbolic function start to appear and definitely in the apex. It should be around there. Okay? So that's more or less the place where you should position your reflecting <coughs> layer and probably you're basically in an imaginary geometry like that. Your refracting wave is traveling like that there and then boom. Tuck, tuck, tuck. So it's going very short path. It's going to be registered quite immediately by any geophone at the distance of 40 feet. So we are very, very shallow, okay? 10, 20 meters. Right. You can observe that you can recognize the crossover point, the critical distance, and you can place the position of your reflector. The hyperbolic function is quite a tipping function, so it tells you that that velocity layer is a quite velocity layer with a quite different velocity respect to the V1, okay? Not that big because the place where the refraction is basically sticking over the distance is not basically uh, is not that uh, nearby respect to the distance. So if, if this is a kind of few 20, 30 meters, well, at 200 meters, we have to have 200 meters to get the crossover point. So you can have, if you want, a, 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 a empirical relative estimation of the velocity of the system by looking at this kind of image. And you can start to play with the dip, the velocity of that first layer. If you know the dipping and you calculate the dipping in terms of distance there and time there, and you, you have an idea of this is representing basically a wave that is traveling directly from the receiver to the source. So if you pick up any of those geophones <coughs> and you compare which velocity that layer is arriving to them, in theory should arrive at the exact same velocity, you can basically have 
I can do constant analysis, different geophones of the direct wave velocity. Then we know the direct wave velocity is concurrent related with certain amount of percentage to the to the direct wave, so you can guess which is the velocity of the direct wave. If you want to do the normal move out, well, we are playing in time, so the things you can do is then to push trace by trace by applying a delta t for every single geophone. So we know the delta t you need to apply in terms of millisecond, but we don't know of this delta t, which is the edge component, so the, the, the thickness component, which is the, the, the velocity component of it. Now, in that case of the first layer, the thickness component can be guessed quite quickly if you use the direct wave velocity that you can get from the source and the receiver. You get the velocity from the direct wave, and this is the velocity of the first layer, which thickness is that one. You know the velocity, we know the thickness in time, you calculate the space. Then, once you calculate the space of that, you got an information about the thickness of the layer on top of that. So you know how much is the thickness that you have to put in the formula that, that the normal move out. So what is changing now is the effect, basically, of the, of the normal move out is basically driven by the velocity. Does this only work on sure? Well, offshore you can have the same same velocity or uh, you can have the same problem, um, the same um, the same use if you put your geophone on the ground. So you have a kind of ocean bottom cable exercise. But the good things of the water is that on the water level you don't <coughs> know you cannot have direct wave, but you know the velocity of the water. So natural system is. It's heavy, but not that heavy. So in case of water, what is the good thing? The good news in case of water is that the first reflector, you know exactly more or less which is the velocity. It's the water. So you can still play the games without even using the, the, the surface wave. And you can reapply the same game by using the ocean bottom cable for the second layer, which is the first seabed and the second layer. Okay. Indigest material. I know. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> that's fine. Now that's a real representation of a real pre-textual gather. <coughs> this is what we got in the real pre-textual gather <coughs> on the right. Pretty, pretty messy, but not completely messy. Now, it's a bit weird then, that pre section gather, but it's pretty weird because you see the distance. Well, can you recognize? Well, it's, it's, it has been interpreted, but <coughs> if I was you, I would object to the interpretation of the reflected wave. I don't say they are wrong, they are correct. But it's not the first hyperbolic function that you see on the, the pre-stash of gather, isn't it? You got several other ones. <coughs> I will see you start to write it probably in depth to have a big hyperbolic there, at least in depth, for sure in depth, isn't it? So it's telling you that the reality <coughs> is a kind of much more complicated reality. Now, we haven't introduced them still, but now it's time to introduce you another kind of animals within the zoo of the wave reflection. And one of the animals is, from my point of view, both as a processor, as an interpreter, they are the most terrible animal. There's the most, I would say, an annoying animal that you can find it. They watch is driven million of money to get solved, they are the bloody multiple. <coughs> the bloody multiple are all those kind of reflective layer that are basically not reflecting once, are reflecting several times they are registered at a certain distance by a geophone, but the travel path is a fake travel path. Because it's a multiple path, or better, <coughs> is a travel path that is fakely representing a single path from the source to the receiver, because they have done that several times. <coughs> so they look like they are arriving very late to a very large, basically, offset. So what's happened is that that one is 
When it arrives, it's interpreted as a P wave traveling with a certain velocity called rocks. It takes a huge amount of time. So you are going to position them very deep. That's a problem. Too deep. Now, and you've always got in here, the, the way that's been interpreted, you've got a series in that case <coughs> of multiple arriving before the real reflection. Now, the only way to get that multiple then you need to be basically offshore and need to have a water bottom multiple. The water bottom multiple are all the multiple that are traveling from the source to the receiver, reflecting on the seabed, and then several times on the water. So water, hair, seabed are the two boundary conditions that reflect, 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 reflect. reflect. Well, you will see there is a good news. For the sea bottom, we can solve the problem. Now we can solve pretty well the problem in several ways. And we are going to, going to show you different ways as soon as we look at But one interesting way you will see it by using the normal move out as well. In any case, we have to interview, we have to basically face not only the real first direct reflection arrival that one you are looking at, but we are facing also a series of multiple there and there and there. So that's why it's pretty crowded, the pre structure of the end. <coughs> Clearly, there hasn't been any kind of tentative to stop the water bottom wave during the acquisition. So the acquisition has been done here at the period during a time of the acquisition when the technology during the acquisition was not that advanced. So we got all sorts of things. What we can recognize apart this kind of animal, we can recognize other animals, the one that you know pretty well, that are this kind of linear one. You see that? Here. And that one clearly in the intersection with the blue one, and that one clearly with a dipping bigger than the blue one. Now, those two ones need necessarily need to be the direct wave, so kind of surface wave, and the refracted wave. As you see, they are arriving much before any reflection, and from the certain point, so from immediately they arrive, from immediately they arrive before the direct wave. So the crossover point almost nearby the source. So it's telling you that the first contrast of velocity is a terrible contrast <coughs> of velocity. So it's basically water with some basalt, or water with some very hard kicking rocks, in which the velocity is a kind of 1,500 meter per second and 3,000 meter per second. But you just arrive with very strong, basically, change of velocity. So the crossover point is very, very short distance to the receiver. Then you got a huge amount of additional kind of noise. <coughs> this part of what we call random noise, and there are those gentlemen in there. And those ones you can interpret as you want, but the only thing they are not, they are not hyperbolic. So if you look along that direction, they look like a kind of signal coming from there. And they are mostly part of the noise that you usually got when you do acquisition and is the noise by the fact that first when you are acquiring with a streamer, a geophone, streamer and geophone, they are vibrating. You got a kind of also seismic noise that is the underground noise of the hurt system. Or system is completely devastated by various series of earthquakes. The earthquakes are producing low frequency vibration of the system. Those vibrations of the system are registered by the geophone. And the geophone is taking over all this kind of information. They have low frequency, very bad amplitude, almost direct wave. And they almost are registered in a kind of random way, constantly by any kind of job. So that's the real way you look, well, uh, how you appear, a kind of pre-texture yet. The question is, well, the real problem you got now is that if you cannot recognize <coughs> the multiple from the real reflection, it's very hard to, to start to understand what you got what, isn't it? <coughs> it is also true. Then the first thing you can start to do is that by using the distance of the diophone and the distance of the two-way travel, then you can apply your manual, that normal move out, to try to see how you can restore this kind of clear, I would say, reflector to their original position. And you know that if you know extra information about that, you can place for sure the apex of this kind of two grain, but any potential apex, if we don't know a priori which is the multi or not, can be a potential reflector. Something is telling you that it's never going to work because to have such a huge amount of reflection. And the seismic experiment of between 40 and 100 hertz is a little bit suspicious. So probably most of them won't be a really good, really good reflector 
Oh, we are going to be multiple. But you can apply the same criteria to all of that. As far as you, if you don't know if there are multiple relevant, I mean, there's no reason why you don't apply the analysis we've been doing so far. So the apex represents the position position of the factor. You apply basically the normal move out, you restore all these kind of things, and you start to transform that kind of pre-stack shock gather in a kind of pre-stack normal move out shock gather. Okay? That's another example of a shock gather in which I would say you recognize pretty well the direct wave. The first hyperbolic component in there. You see there is a change of dipping in there. It's broken and then it's going at a different velocity. That's probably the appearance, the crossover point of your refraction. So probably the refraction is appearing in that place where you got this kind of very, very, I would say, fat amplitude. And the fat amplitude are the summation probably of two signal. Probably the signal related to the refraction that here is Highly distinguished by the geophone, and then it's changing completely in orientation and picking up probably in there. So, probably the refraction is starting in there, that one. That's where it starts to be registered by the geophone, and that's where it starts to be registered by the geophone. There is a piece where they are almost overprinting each other. But you see, because there is a change of direction, and a surface weight doesn't change direction as far as it's traveling around. The first layer, the first layer in that case is still above the first reflection. It could be a multiple, but in that case it has to be above that one. Above that one, you got all this kind of behavior. So it has to be an overprint in between refracted way that is moving on and a direct way. So it's the crossover point. What are those evenings? <coughs> How they look like? How they look like? How is their basically distribution? Hyperbolic, parabolic, or linear? Mm -hmm. Triangle is the summation of them. But I would say yes, the, the, it's linear. So you can, you can trace a kind of triangle, correct, to separate those. But I tell you that there is a kind of line defining them. So it's linear. The only way to be linear, there need to be a surface wave. <coughs> you remember when I told you that there are some kind of surface wave that have a very low frequency and they are rolling, rolling across the geophone. Those are what we call the ground roll. So those are low velocity, very low frequency ground roll wave. Okay? Yeah. Well, we don't like that. What we like, basically, we don't like that, we don't like, well, you don't like that, you don't like that, and you like the, these kind of things. Like the reflection. You want to see the reflection, and then you want to play with the reflection to recorrect the imaging. So what the people do, they apply a filter to get out to rid of them, but as you see, the result of getting rid of them is that you cancel a bit of the true signal in a bit of, I mean, a bit of the reflection signal as well, as far as you cancel most of the ground roll. And you have to cut off all these objects that are basically before this kind of first reflection to cut off all the direct and the refractive wave. So that's the cleanest version of it. So how do you think we could clean this kind of this kind of wave object? Oh, this is another example, for example, which you can clean it. You recognize the direct wave and the refracted wave. You see that one? A slightly different angle respect to those one. So you got a huge amount of overprint of quite linear object with a slightly different dipping. But in there, so you got probably an amalgamation of several refracted and direct wave. You got a huge amount of signal in there as well interfering. So could be multiple of the surface wave as well. It's another beast of the beast. So the zoo is growing up. But you got the first, again, hyperbolic component and reflection in there. What the people did in there, they clean it up, all of them, like that. So you apply a filter, you clean it up. Now, that's in a kind of 
a precursor information about what we are going to do. But basically, to cancel the multiple, we have three possibilities. We know that the multiple <laughs> should have a kind of, well, there are different type of multiple, we are going to see them. It's only depend, some multiple got a very weird velocity, so they are positioned in the wrong way, so below some other real rock reflection but with a velocity that is very weird, so it is around the velocity water. So in that case, when you apply the normal move out to this kind of multiple, you realize soon that the more normal move out you have to apply requires a velocity that is of the velocity of the water. And this is not possible if it is happening below a secure or a sure reflection of a proper lithology. So unless you got a proper seaside of one kilometer in between your stratigraphy, it's never going to happen. That multiple need to be, I mean, that object is in the wrong place and you can recognize it. So velocity can be helpful. But multiple that are intra multiple, they have the same velocity and the normal reflector. So the velocity doesn't help you to recognize that. But we know that some of the M, so multiple intra extremely complicated to, to solve it. Direct wave or refracted wave, well, those ones, the velocity are usually quite different, and they arrive, they kind of, they kind of register it, usually quite before, for a while, quite before the first arrival of the reflection. <coughs> the thing that you know is that refracted wave and direct wave got a completely different frequency. So frequency is the other information that you will need to use to cancel those objects. So at certain points, the game we are going to do is to transform that three stacks together from offset to time to offset to frequency, or wavelength to frequency. So that all the reflected way we appear with the same amount of frequency, the direct way with a different type of frequency, and playing with the frequency domain, you can cancel all the pre stack basically in the pre stack stage, all the Dark wave and the refractive wave. Okay? Now, for that kind of slide, I would say <coughs> the argument of what I call the topic related to the ray trace theory is almost almost done. What we need to start is a new subject, and it is. 